Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And it's my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so grateful that you are taking time out of your day today to worship with us. And we believe that God is going to meet you and encounter you in this time. We'd love the chance to get to connect with you. So if you would take a second and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in a few moments. There you can let us know that, there, that you're here and worshiping with us and you can let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Holy and loving God, in this hour of worship, open our ears to hear you, our lips to praise you, our minds to understand you, our hearts to love you, and when we leave, our hands to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me if it was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. That is good enough for me. Oh, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me if it was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It's good for the Hebrew children. That is good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. That is good enough for me. Oh, give me that one time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Hello Church, my name is Eunsoo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great privilege to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, we come before you with open eyes and willing hands. Guide us as we listen for your word with a shout of praise and dances of joy. Lord, we are reminded that Life indeed has its twists and turns. Sometimes things happen that feel like more than we can bear. Yet, in the midst of these challenges, we seek your presence and your guidance. Help us to see the good, even in our darkest moment. May we find strength and comfort in knowing that you are always with us turning our hardships into opportunities for growth and faith. Guide us, Lord, as we strive to grasp the death of your love and the breath of your compassion, which never fails to surprise and uplift us. Help us discern what is right and just, and to set our hope in Christ, who is our anchor and our salvation. Lord, we lift up our country and community. May your peace and righteousness reign in this place as it is in heaven. Especially now, we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. For those who are sick, may they find healing and peace. For those who are grieving, 
may they find comfort and hope. For those who feel lost or alone, may they feel your loving presence and guidance. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Riceville United Methodist Church through mail and website. Let us continue to worship our God. I'm Pastor Eunsu. I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. So I have a question. Do you like music? And have you ever played a musical instrument? I love music, especially playing the piano. I believe God enjoys it when we make a joyful noise for Him. So I'm going to play a song and you can guess what it is. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Yes, what it was? Yes, Jesus loves me this I know. So when do you normally sing? Well, maybe in church, um, in Sunday school, mm, oh yeah, and a birthday party. And well, even in the shower. But um, do you ever sing when you're feeling sad? Or it, um, what about when it's something like um, in something's wrong or you are in trouble? Well, this seems like very odd times to sing, right? We usually sing when we are happy and excited, right? Well, there is a story in the Bible about two people who were singing in a very tough situation. Their names were Paul and Silas. Well, they got arrested for helping someone. Um, some leaders didn't like what they were doing and proclaiming in the name of Jesus. So they had them thrown in prison. Well, I have never been in jail, but I think if I got arrested, I would feel very sad and very upset, especially if I didn't do anything wrong. But guess what Paul and Silas were doing late at night in prison? They were singing. They were singing in jail. Well, even though they were in a very tough situation, they knew that they were doing the right thing by honoring God. So they could sing and they could pray. And something happened, very remarkable things happened while they were singing and praying. The earthquake hit. The ground shook so hard that it broke the jail doors open. Well, the man uh, guard, uh, guarding the jail was very upset, thinking the prisoners um, had escaped. But Paul reassured him that everyone was still there, and Paul told him about Jesus. And eventually, the man guarding the, the jail, he accepted the Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he found peace. What does this Bible story teach us? Uh, does it mean we should be always happy and sing a song even when we feel sad? No, not necessarily. We will not be always happy and we will not always want to sing. But we can pray anytime, any situation, and every situation, no matter what. And through that, we can remember God is always with us. 
He wants to hear us, uh, whether they are joyful songs or even the prayers of sadness. God loves our joyful noise and even the sad noise. So why don't we make a noise through our prayer? We are going to do a echo prayer, so please uh, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me. Help me rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hello, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I just want to thank you for taking a few minutes to worship with us today. We're looking at the book of Acts throughout this summer, and the book of Acts uh, tells us about the disciples spreading the gospel first in Jerusalem and then out into uh, communities around the Mediterranean Sea. And so we're looking today in chapter 16. Paul and Silas are two of the early um, apostles that are starting uh, churches, and they've run into a bit of a problem um, by simply doing something that the people of, that, of this particular town weren't accustomed to. Let's pick up in chapter 16, beginning in verse 20. They were brought before the magistrates, and others said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they'd given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them, keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost sail and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he as an entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, where we are locked in our own prisons, unfasten those chains and help us to live freely, knowing that um, you have called on us and have uh, delivered us. Lord, I pray that um, we will be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, centuries ago, at the Strait of Gibraltar in Spain, that marked the end of the Mediterranean Sea and the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean, these words were inscribed into the rocks there. No more beyond. It was a warning to sailors and an appropriate statement since that area was considered the end of the world. But later, Christopher Columbus discovered a whole new world, thousands of miles beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. So somebody came along and scratched out a word on those famous rocks so that it simply said, more beyond. And today, that is the national motto of Spain, more beyond. Whenever life tumbles in upon us, it's easy to have a no more beyond attitude. While facing what appears to be insurmountable challenges, we say to ourselves, there's no hope and there's no life beyond this one. Before long, we convince ourselves that there's no more light beyond our darkness. And then the mental bars of defeat and discouragement appear, and we begin to lock ourselves up in our own self-made prisons. 
I'm sure Paul and Silas were tempted to wallow in this attitude when they were locked up in a dark, dingy prison cell, facing the grim reality that they might not see another tomorrow. But Paul and Silas reflected a spirit far beyond their circumstances. The hymns they sang while shackled in chains testified to their inner assurance that God was bigger than the challenges that they faced. As they winked at their adversity, God shook the foundations of the prison, tore apart their shackles, and flung open the prison doors. They were free. Now, come with me and use your spiritual imagination to see Paul and Silas running from their broken prison cells into our 21st century lives. They appear lifting up torches of light and shouting to us, whatever challenge you face, it is not the end. There's something more beyond. We have experienced it, for we know a God who is greater than pain, greater than tragedy, even greater than death. We know a God who frees those who are in bondage. Come to know this God, and you too will find more beyond whatever challenges you encounter. As you continue to imagine the powerful witness of Paul and Silas, my hope is that your spirit will be saturated with courage. And your once distraught season of life will come to embody the attitude and spirit of a determined disciple of Jesus Christ. To encourage you, I want to highlight certain truths which appear in this magnificent passage of Scripture. As you begin to understand these truths, you'll be better equipped to live a life of faith and hope. So let's take a look. Number one, there are going to be difficulties. Contrary to popular opinion and certain television preachers, Christians are not immune from pain and disappointment. The notion of a cotton candy theology that promises all health and wealth and no turmoil or tribulation is ridiculous. Tragedies happen. Just this week, it was announced that more than 300 people have died this summer in the Phoenix area because of the heat. The week before, more than 2 million lost power in Texas after Hurricane Barrel came through there. Many of those people were Christians, of course. And a week later, more than 100,000 still didn't have power and were forced to deal with this oppressive heat. Did these people suffer because they didn't have enough faith? Why, just this week, a tornado ripped a steeple off a church in Rome, New York. Off a church! Scripture does not teach that Christians will escape the tragedies and turmoils of life. In fact, Scripture teaches that difficulties are inevitable. For example, we read that before Paul and Silas were thrown into jail, they were stripped of their clothing and beaten with rods. Awful. Yet when we read the New Testament, we notice that such treatment is pretty routine. Paul confirms this in 2 Corinthians when he gives a litany of trials and tribulations that he and others of faith have had to endure. Take a look at the list. Afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. After reading this litany, you must conclude that if Paul were alive today, he'd be nauseated by those who preach a prosperity gospel. Paul knew that he would face opposition to his message as well. However, what's important to remember is that he didn't cower from this fact. His resolve remained strong. In fact, later in the aforementioned passage, Paul's rhetoric is on the offensive. He says, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything, from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. For Paul, it was unimportant how badly Christians were treated, for he believed they were empowered by a towering faith that enabled them to endure and rise victoriously above any problem they were facing. Which brings us to point number two. We do not face our problems alone. In the far western part of our state, there are many stories about the Native Americans who once lived there and made that part of the state their own. I especially like the story about the ritual of initiation for Cherokee boys entering adulthood. Near age 11, a young Cherokee travels deep into the Pisgah forest, armed only with a bow and arrow. This ritual is intended to prove his bravery, yet the whole night he's terrified. 
Every hoot of an owl sounds like a menacing monster. Every cracking twig whispers of a demon. But when morning finally comes, the young brave sees another Cherokee hiding behind a tree. It's his own father, who's been lovingly watching all night long, making sure that his child did not have to face the darkness alone. This story reflects a powerful truth that should anchor us when we face difficulties in our life. This truth certainly anchored Paul. As he sat in that dark prison cell with Silas, I'm confident he was comforted by the promise which he wrote about in his letter to his friends in Rome. He said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the promise which Paul gave the capability to survive and overcame one difficulty after another. He knew that he had a source of strength that could sustain and empower him. As he faced the dark hour of persecution, he was certain that God was with him, giving him the courage to face the ugliest of terrors. He had the confidence that the same power which was with him in darkness would lead him into the light. Paul was absolutely persuaded that with God there was nothing strong enough, evil enough, or powerful enough that could defeat him, not even death. And so it is with us. When the storms of life rage and roar, God is near, caring and encouraging, making sure we do not face the darkness alone. But most importantly, God gives us the gift of light, which pierces our darkness and liberates us to live a life of faith, hope, and love. As I reflect on the witness of Paul and Silas, one of the images that keeps coming into my mind is one of dandelions cracking through rocks. You ever seen this? You've probably seen them so much you don't even think anything about it. But I find it inspiring. You hike up a mountain or walk down a sidewalk and you find a huge rock or a piece of concrete with these big yellow dandelions growing right through them. It's incredible. Tiny yet determined. Dandelions with so much desire for sunlight that they literally crack through rocks so that they can bask in the sunlight and bloom victoriously. I believe that Paul and Silas were given the same type of strength to break out of jail. The hymns of faith and praise that they sang penetrated the walls of their cells. Even other prisoners heard the healing notes that were bursting forth with the power of the gospel. No cold, hard, rock-like prison could squelch the joyful notes of two men who were confident that they were in the hands of Almighty God. Their songs of faith broke through their chains, and the foundation of the prison shook until they were free again. As Christians, we are like those dandelions that have the power to crack through the rocks of opposition. We have the power to crack through the rocks of suffering. We have the power to crack through the rocks of tragedy. We have the power to crack through the rocks of doom and death. And that power is the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ. Point number three. Problems can be turned into possibilities. The biblical scholar William Barclay once wrote, Endurance is not just bearing rough times, but turning rough times into glory. I believe this is what Paul was declaring when he wrote, We are more than conquerors, in Romans 8, verse 37. Not only can we overcome the tragedies of life, but with the help of God, we can turn trouble into triumph. Earlier in that chapter, Paul declared it another way. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. When we put these inspired thoughts of Paul together, we should become aware that evil and tragedy are never, ever the will of God. But God majors in taking evil and turning it into good. Over and over again in scripture and history, we see this. Over and over again in life, we see this. When evil attacks with pain, God uses it to build character. When evil shows resistance, God uses it to build strength. When evil cripples with tragedy, God finds a way to victory. 
When evil destroys with death, God resurrects. <coughs> when the momentum of evil rolls our way, God takes that momentum, transforms it, and rolls it back into evil's way. Wendell Wilkie was right when he said, what a person needs to get ahead is a powerful enemy. The Chinese language affirms this similar principle. The word crisis in Chinese has two characters, one representing danger and the other opportunity. When we are faced with difficulties, the same truth applies. God can take the worst evil and transform it into an opportunity for victorious change. It reminds me of a story that I shared years ago, but I think bears repeating. When September 11th happened back in 2001, I was living in Hayesville, North Carolina, a small mountain time, town 425 miles west of here in a county that borders Georgia. And there, just like everywhere, after the terrorists took over those planes and crashed them into the World Trade Center buildings, the Pentagon, and eventually a field in Pennsylvania, there was a lot of misplaced anger toward Muslims throughout America. Lots of hate crimes. Back in Hayesville, there was less than 10,000 people in the whole county. And according to census data, more than 98% of them were white. Unless we drove to Atlanta or Asheville, we very, very rarely ran into anyone who was African American or Hispanic. And we never ever saw anyone from a predominantly Muslim country, except for one guy. That one guy was Pakistani, and he ran a Texaco station in the middle of nowhere on the road between Hayesville and Franklin, North Carolina. Since I lived in Hayesville, but worked at a church in Franklin, and this was the only gas station on the 38-mile stretch between the two towns, I stopped in there quite a bit. He told me this story. On the evening of September 12th, a bunch of guys in pickup trucks drove up to the Texaco station owned by the man from Pakistan. They got out of their trucks and grabbed their rifles. The owner of the store was terrified. He knew these guys, but he'd also heard about the hate crimes that were going on around the country that day and figured he was about to be the next victim. That's when one of them came in the store and said, don't worry about a thing. We're going to stay here and keep an eye out all night long. We promise you'll be safe. And they did that every night for the next week. Now generally, I'm not in favor of people who aren't in law enforcement standing guard with rifles outside a gas station, but this was an anxious moment in history and the community was not going to let anyone take out their hatred on the one Middle Eastern man in the county just because of his race. Instead, he was protected and encouraged and was shown to be part of the community too. Jesus' work on the cross is the ultimate example of opposition being transformed into opportunity. Before Jesus, the cross represented suffering, shame, punishment, death. But he came and transformed it into a symbol of forgiveness, victory, love, and life. So whenever we gaze upon the cross today, we're reinforced by the reality that God in Christ takes what is ugly and makes it beautiful. The great preacher Harry Emerson Fosdick once told a true story about the transforming love of Jesus Christ. A young woman lived in war-torn Armenia in the early 1900s. A Turkish soldier chased her and her brother down a dead-end alley until he caught up with the brother, and he killed the brother, but the young woman escaped. Later, she was captured and put to work in a military hospital as a nurse. One day, the man who had murdered her brother was a patient in the very hospital where she was assigned, and in fact, assigned to her ward. When she recognized him, she was horrified. But he'd been critically wounded, and she knew that the slightest neglect would cause his death. Suddenly, a very difficult battle waged within her. One side of her wanted vengeance, of course. She thought, here's my chance. No one's ever going to know. But Christ's spirit reigned victorious inside her. She nursed him back to health and prayed for him daily. And when the soldier finally recovered, he asked the nurse in amazement, Why? You recognize me. Why did you care for me so faithfully? She replied, Because I serve him who said, Love your enemies and do them good. That is my faith. The soldier was silent 
as he reflected on such strange and foreign words. Then he replied, Tell me more of your religion. Tell me more of your Lord. I'd give anything to have a faith like yours. Isn't that what happened in the infamous jail cell so many years ago? Paul and Silas were faced with opposition and yet, with God's help, were able to seize an opportunity. They transformed their cell into a sanctuary and their jailer came to the altar. They did not fight evil with evil, but overcame evil with good. Paul and Silas had a choice, and now we have a choice. We can stay locked up in our own prisons, or we can seize the opportunity that God has created out of opposition. Let us pray that God will help each of us look at our own difficulties in the face and say with unwavering courage the words of poet Charles Reeb, I will be untouched in the midst of fire. I will stand firm in the midst of a storm. I will not crack in the midst of chaos. I will not lose heart when the world is torn. I will not fear when heat blazes. I will not fret when drought comes. I will bear fruit in the midst of it all. I will march to a different drum. I will discover victory in tragedy. I will trust in El Shaddai. I will laugh in the face of death. I will wave evil and pain goodbye. Yes, we will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, teach us to be more like Jesus, who instead of fighting with his enemies, went to the cross and died for them. And for the sins of all of us, Lord, we continue to face problems every day. Sometimes we even face opposition. Help us to keep singing your praise, even in the midst of our daily struggles. Lord, help us to be that dandelion in the rock, showing beauty in the midst of a tough world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So many of us find ourselves trapped in prison cells. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's someone you love, and maybe it was something that we created, or more than likely we're just victims of living in a broken world. Bad things happen to good people. It's true. But Paul and Silas have taught us to keep the faith even in the midst of our struggles. And I encourage you to do so as well. To sing God's praise. And maybe just in that, transformation will take place. Maybe in your heart, maybe in the hearts of those around you, as we continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.